So can't anyone tell me how do you say that? Chesh? 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 Okay. So I'm really happy to be here. Apparently we are here, right? Just down there, right? Scrag? But there's no games here. Anyway, so I live, I live in London, then uh, hello. But actually I was born in uh, Switzerland, the French part of Bonjour. Uh, this is where I actually started working in the mobile industry uh, in the previous dot-com boom. Uh, I love that Don earlier said uh, this is a year of mobile because their oldest running joke in the industry is saying that every year for the past 14 years we've been saying this is a year of mobile and uh, it never had happened and that finally is happening. Uh, but actually my father is Greek uh, which explains my uh, last name Yasas or Yasu. My mother was from Finland, Huva Paeva. I lived in Cyprus before living in London before that, I uh, lived in the Philippines, uh, where is actually the tax capital of the world. People are taxing much more than any other countries in the world. And before that, and this is the important part for today, I was living in Japan. Hajimashite porudes. That's how you say hello, my name is Paul. And I'm going to talk a little bit about Japan. So I'm not going to tell you about explaining the Japanese industry, because that doesn't really make any sense for you guys. I'm going to take the lessons we can learn of what happened in Japan and what I have learned in Japan and what can be applied here uh, in Europe or even in the US. But this is a map of the Tokyo train system. So as you can see, it's quite complex. Uh, this is exactly how the mobile ecosystem and the web ecosystem is in Japan. Uh, I used to live just here. Uh, but as you can see, uh, most people where they go to, uh, uh, if you, uh, has anyone been to Japan yet? Raise your hands. Oh, that's got a good amount of people. Actually, I'm happy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull you in later on then. I'm going to simplify this map and take the, the m most famous line, which is called the Yamanote line. It's a circle line that goes around Tokyo. And I'm go, go, uh, going to go around these, all these, the major stations of the Tokyo system, and I will tell you a story about uh, what I learned there and what you can learn there. First of all, Shinjuku. So Shinjuku is, I, had, I have the best memories of this station because this was a station that was next to my place. Uh, it's the biggest station, train station in the world. Every day you have 7 million people commuting. Uh, imagine that, I come from Switzerland, we are 7 million people in Switzerland. So I have one new Switzerland every day in this station. And then you can see on the screens this is uh, on the east side of the station, my favorite part, it's a little bit Blade, Blade Runner, as you can see it. Old Tokyo is like that. But what does it mean? Shinjuku, the word in, in, in Japanese, means the new place to stay, which was really uh, fitting for me because I just arrived in Tokyo in 2008. So please, everybody raise your hands here. Everybody, come on. Come on, raise your hands, everybody, thank you. Uh, this is a trick idea. I will stop doing it because now it doesn't work anymore. Uh, it's, I always get 100%, and the question is, who's got a smartphone? And uh, I used to say, who's got a mobile phone, but now I'm, pre I'm pretty confident of being able to say, who's got a smartphone, and it actually works. Uh, I've even been in countries when the, actually the rate was 140%, because some people had two or three smartphones with them. In Japan, in 2010, 2G was killed meaning there's no more 2G, there's only 3G. The number of, of uh, subscriber, subscribers is 125 million, meaning that basically everybody, uh, the, uh, Jap Japan is a, uh, is a country of 127 million people, 125 million people have uh, a mobile phone. You can see the, the breakup of the three, uh, three major operators, if that interests you. 90% of these people actually have, uh, sorry, 90% is the, the mobile uh, broadband penetration. Everybody has fast speed internet on their mobile phone. It has been for a very long time. Uh, I know someone was telling, uh, talking about numbers and how the numbers were wrong before. I'll come back to that later, but the number that was displayed for Japan were correct. Uh, 40, 47 uh, of the population accesses uh, the, mo uh, the mobile web monthly uh, versus only 22% in the US. So at least once a month, uh, uh, half of the Japanese population goes on the mobile web. I know that for some people, for geeks, it seems low, but actually it's very high. Because we tend to go to on, on our mobile, on mobile and using the mobile web every single day. But for most people, it's actually more rare. And Japan has the highest number along with uh, South Korea. Uh, these are the breakdowns. Uh, actually, in Japan, before uh, the arrival on, of smartphones, everybody already had uh, mobile internet. It started actually in the 90s, so it's pretty, pretty, pretty early. And you can see the breakdown here about, these are, 
the portals. If you buy a mobile phone in Japan, you will have access to a portal of, of your dedicated uh, operator. Here would be Play, Orange, uh, whoever else is in this country. Uh, these are the three main players, and these, as you can see, Docomo has, for instance, 52 million people subscribe to their mobile portal. So they go through that portal to access the internet. Next station, Ikebukuro. It's a station I really love as well. Uh, lots of shopping to be done there, ladies. Uh, it's the, the meaning of the word is the bond pack, uh, and I've translated that into a pack of money. What I want to show you here is that, you know, you've seen the numbers and everybody's been talking about that. So Facebook has uh, uh, approximately less than a billion uh, users, uh, accounts, and half of them, so 500 million, are actually accessing Facebook through a uh, mobile device, so either through a mobile web or through uh, a, um, an app. The revenue that was in the SM1, the revenue was uh, av on average $1 billion uh, of revenue. So remember the, the numbers, you have like almost a billion people and you have a billion of revenue. Uh, I'm just going to take an, an example in Japan, uh, DNA Mobage Town is a, a virtual social network in Japan. They have 25 million users, it's only mobile, and in 2010 they already had 1.3 billion US dollars of revenue. So with way, 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 way less people, they're making much, 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 much more money. And this is something that will actually happen uh, in our countries as well. I'll come to that a little bit later. Bueno, so this is going to be the longest station we're going to stay at today. Bueno, I love the station because it's both old Japan and new Japan. You have the very, very fancy new shops, electronic stores. At the same time, you have the very, very old-fashioned uh, uh, small markets. Uh, this is actually one part. You can see the small markets on, on below, and on the top you have the massive buildings. This is why I really love it. There's a lot of fake bags as well, if you're interested in that, uh, which is very rare in Japan. And the, the, me the, the meaning of the term ueno means upper field. And I, basically I want to tell you what's the vision of the mobile future. What I saw there and what's going to happen here. This is the, the key of my presentation. First, a few numbers. So I told you Facebook we know that half of their users access Facebook through a, a mobile device. So about, about 500 uh, million. Twitter, it's an estimate because we don't have the real numbers. Let's say 60 million people use almost only uh, Twitter through a mobile device. It's very hard to measure. This is a pure guesstimate. Uh, and the three other names you see there are Japanese uh, social network. First is called Grieve, the second is DNA, the one I showed you just before on the screen, and the third is called Mixi. Maybe the one, has anyone heard of any of these three here? Can you raise your hand if you have? You, you're cheating because you've been here. He's, he's been listening to me talking for two years, so obviously he's heard about it. Uh, so the first one has more or less 35 million users. I've rounded up the numbers because they change every, uh, every day anyway. The second one has, as you can see, 25 million, and Mixi has 25, uh, 21 million. I put estimate on Mixi because these, these would be the people that access Mixi through a mobile phone. Actually, if you look at the numbers, GRI, 99% of, of the users access GRI only with a mobile phone. On DNA, they have no choice. So 100 people of the, of the, of the people access uh, uh, DNA only through their mobile phone. And Mixi have a choice, but still, and that shows how Japanese is. There is, like Facebook, there is a, a website but 80% of the access are still done through a mobile phone. So 80% of the users opt to access this website through their mobile phones. This is why I put 21 million, because actually the numbers of uh, Mixi users is uh, slightly uh, higher. Just to tell you the number of users of Facebook and Twitter in Japan, so you have a uh, sort of a comparison. The numbers of uh, Facebook users actually, uh, a lot of people are questioning it. Uh, they, I put 8.5 five million users uh, in Japan. Some people, it's, uh, some people say it's 10. No matter. If you compare for what I just, just shown you before, compared to Greed, DNA, and Mixi, it's just uh, a, a small player. Whereas, actually, Twitter is much more important. They have 30 million accounts. That's, an, again, an estimate. It, uh, it's a 20 million accounts. It doesn't mean that people use it every day. But it's, a, it's the second most active country in the world. Second most country active in the world is actually Japan. There was a reason for that. Uh, Japan started very early, early using Twitter. Actually, Twitter opened their offices in Japan. That was the first uh, international office uh, after uh, the US. And you have the uniques as well, if you, if you matter. I don't, I don't want to stay too long on this. 25, who knows what the TPS is? If anyone reads TechCrunch nowadays, you should know. Tweets per second. So basically, they, uh, it's 
every time there's usually a big sport event, uh, like it might be at the end of this uh, Euro 2012, you will, will probably see a lot of people tweeting about a final, especially if it's very nice. And actually, what, will, what Twitter is doing is actually they display numbers and say, at, at some point in time, there were that number of tweets talking about that event. And uh, the, me the re records up to recently were mostly about sporting events. And one day, in December uh, 2011, so not that long time ago, the number, by the way, the, re the, re the previous record was about 8,000 tweets per second. And then suddenly, out of Japan comes this number of 25, almost 26,000 uh, tweets per second. Imagine, 20 tweets per second. So it's every second there's 26,000 tweets. And nobody actually understood what it was. And actually, it's completely stupid. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a comic. It's an anime. So it's an animation movie that's very actually kind of old. It's from the 80s. That was on TV. And there's one line in the, the animation that no one understands. It's been 20 years, nobody understands what it means. Uh, if, you've, if you've seen it in English, you won't have understand. I'll, I can give you the name and the title if you want to look it up on IMDb later. But what happened is the Japanese are so obsessed with that line that they don't know what it is. That the exact moment where that line was, was mentioned in the movie, the whole Japanese Twitter sphere started tweeting about it. And there you had that record of 20, 25,000 tweets per second, just to mean that they can be very, very highly engaged for very, very strange a reason. Uh, have you seen this world map of social networks? It's very recent, it's just a week ago. Who's seen that already? Okay, so can, can anyone tell me what's wrong with these kind of maps? No, okay. Do you know how they, do you know how they measure? Do you know how, how we measure what's, how can, you, how can they say? Basically, the blue here means it's Facebook is the number one uh, social network. So it's the first social network in that country. You can see North America, South America, all of Europe, almost Africa, uh, Australia. They all have Facebook as number one. And you can see some differences uh, in, in Asia. Of course, in China, where Facebook is forbidden. Uh, do you, they calculate by the number of people accessing you know, with Nielsen scores. So basically, they use analytics and web accesses. The real, real problem, and that's why I said, yeah, right, is that it's impossible to measure, it's very hard, I would not say impossible, to measure mobile accesses. We don't know, actually, how, uh, how many people accesses these social networks or any website through a mobile device, uh, especially when it's an app. So you can see Japan, if you know where Japan is, I hope for your sake that you know where it is, you can see that Japan is, is in blue. Uh, so, supposedly, Facebook would be number one. So, uh, this map was all already shown, uh, only shown last week. What I want to say by that is that don't trust these numbers. These numbers, as I've just shown you, Facebook has only, let's say, 10 million uh, users in Japan. It's not, not the no, no, far from being the number one. The only thing is that since they cannot measure mobile accesses, they say, oh, Gree, we're not going to measure it. DNA, we're not going to measure it. And Mixi, we might measure, but only the web accesses. And then, obviously, Facebook comes first. What I'm telling you about that is just do not believe these kind of statistics. They're very good at Mashable because Mashable likes to say, oh, yeah, the new social network is blah, blah, blah. But they don't, don't really care about that. Trust the experts. Ask people like me and others if you want to know the real numbers. So mobile centric, you've realized that. Japan is mobile centric. Who knows this app? I mean, come on, you're all using it, right? Instagram. What, it, what was the first thing that actually mattered to me when I saw Instagram? Of course, I love photography, but the first thing that really mattered to me, it's mobile only. It's, there's no way you can upload a picture from the internet. There's no way you can actually even use the website for internet. You can, you can see one picture at a time and that's it. There's absolutely nothing. And this is exactly what Jap Japan has been doing in the past uh, uh, 15 years. Mobile only. I've shown you Greed DNA. You can only access them through mobile. So this was the, this was the first step, the first time we've seen that in our territories where, a mo where an app would be only mobile and also very successful. Uh, who knows about this one? Who's been using it? Oh, well, you should actually. It's really cool. Uh, so Path. What is Path? Path is a social network. Uh, I would say a private social network, not private because it's a private by, the, by op opposition to public. You cannot have your profile public. On, you can only share up to 150 people, that's it. You cannot have more than 150 friends you, you, to share with. 
So, and that's the Dunbar number. It's a theory that says you cannot, you cannot manage more than 150 friends. That's why they went for that number. But basically, what it is, first of all, it's mobile only. It's still iPhone only, but it will go Android very soon. And it's extremely, extremely close to what you see in Japan. Meaning, you only have a circle of people you, want to, you, you trust, and this circle of people will get your updates. This is the second example that I've seen recently of mobile-only apps, especially this one is a social network, although we can argue that Instagram is a social network as well, that only uses mobile. It is actually very successful. You should actually try it. It's really well designed, by the way. And I think Don, if he's around, Don Dodge has invested in that thing, so I'm, I'm sure he's happy that I'm mentioning it. Uh, third pair, we've heard about this one. Okay, so this is a social network well, only on mobile, but for two people only. So basically, it's you and somebody else. Usually, it's you and your girlfriend, you and your mistress, you and your wife, you and your kids. So this is how it works. Again, this is, of course, not as successful as two, as the two previous ones, but I mean by that, you can see the trend. These, these apps are more and more uh, mobile only. Why? And I believe, I strongly believe, my area of expertise, I do uh, consumer forensics. Consumer forensics, as like, like Ben did uh, just before with gaming, I study behaviors. What do people do with their devices? When do they do it and how to do it? This is a perfect example. If, you, if you're in the morning and you leave, let's say this morning, let's say you didn't have a plane, obviously. You come here and you realize you forgot your wallet. Most, more chances are that you will not come home, go, go back home to get, grab your wallet. But if you forgot your phone this morning, what will you do? You will go back home and grab your phone because your phone has everything about you in there and you need your phone all the time. And it's not only because you have information that matters to you, it's because you have an intimate relationship with the phone. You have an intimate relationship with your phone. Your phone is your girlfriend, your phone is, a, is your boyfriend. You don't want to leave, you don't want to share it with anyone. If I go to whoever has a laptop here and I, and I ask you, can I, can I check my Gmail? You'll say, oh, well, okay, and you give, you give me your laptop, and I just open uh, the, the web, and I'm going to check my Gmail. Can I ask you the same thing with your phone? Will you give me your phone to check my email? Probably not, because you have this, you have this very intimate relationship with it. You give it a lot of information, and actually, that's also why it's interesting, for all, and these apps are actually playing on it. You give, and that's also something I've realized during these studies, you give actually more information in a phone than you will do on a web. Because not only it's because it's right now and you have your phone in front of you, it's also because of this, you transfer this type of relationship you have with your phone, you transfer it on the data you're, you're okay to put in there. So you will actually put more intimate stories about you through a mobile phone. This is actually very important. Sorry, I need to drink something. So this is another one. Though, if I continue, so if you realize the three themes I've mentioned here is Mobility, obviously, but anonymity and privacy. These three, net, these three examples I've just given you are mo mobile, of course, anonymous for some of them. So Instagram is, if you decide so, anonymous. You, can, you don't have to put your real name there, okay? So it's kind of private as well. Privacy, that's the other one, uh, path. It's pri you don't share anything with the outside world. You only share with your 150 friends or less. Meaning it's absolutely private. You can share more maybe because you, won't, you, you, don't, you, have, you have a trust that your information won't be shared with anyone else. And, and the last one has, has privacy and less anonymity. But what I mean by that is that the three Japanese social networks I mentioned actually work on that for a long time. Privacy, anonymity, mobility. It's only mobile, you don't have to put your real name, and it's actually completely private. What I say about completely private is that if it's anonymous, you can, do, you can say whatever you want, you, you, you care less about privacy. But if it's actually, uh, if you put your real name so it's less anonymous, then obviously you care more about privacy. And this is what Japanese social networks have understood for a long time, and that's something we're actually starting to understand here uh, uh, in Europe and the US. I just want to quickly mention that Mixi, because Mixi, you know, there's been a huge debate. Who's been following the debate? Who has a Google Plus account here? Yeah, pretty much, actually pretty much everyone has. You just have to activate it because pretty much everyone has uh, a Gmail. So there was a, there was a debate at the very beginning of it. Should we allow, should Google allow people to use uh, real uh, pseudonyms or not? So should I be mandatorily use my name, Paul Papadimitri, or could I use anything else? 
And there was a big debate at the very beginning, so some, some, some many people, you know, in our countries it's very easy to put our real names. Because in our countries, I guess in Poland as well, you don't have, for instance, you don't have a, you, you're not in a police state, you're not in a uh, dictatorship, for instance, so people will actually uh, serve all your activities, or you might want to be hidden be behind a pseudonym. Uh, but Mixi allows uh, this uh, pseudonym, so basically because of the way Japanese society is, sh is, 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 is embracing, people do not want to share their real name online. I'm going to come back to that a little bit later, but this is a debate that's been going on in Japan for a long time. The age limit, who's heard about the age limit on Facebook? So Facebook has an age limit. You, you might have seen a Facebook has an age limit of 13 years old. They want to lower it. They want to, they want to allow younger kids to access uh, Facebook. Actually, Mixi for a long time was forbidden for under 18 years old. And they, they switched to 15 years old about two years ago. But what they did, and that's also interesting for Facebook, what they did, they said, okay, we're going to allow younger people to go there, but we'll, they will never, ever appear in the search results. I cannot look up someone who's under 18 on Mixi. The person might exist, but I cannot look it up. Look him or her up, obviously. And they also introduced a two-tiered friend system, meaning that you have two types of circles. You have your close friends when you share everything with them, and you have a more looser number of friends when you actually share less. I know that Facebook has something similar with the lists, but actually it's not as, it's, first of all, it's not as um, prevalent on Facebook because most people do not actually use lists. But the thing uh, uh, you have to, uh, uh, again, to, uh, pay attention to is that they already solved the privacy issue. They said, okay, we're going to allow younger kids, but for everyone, if you have, if you don't want to share stuff with people with the outside the world, you can only share with a limited number of people. If you think about it, that's exactly how PATH works. Uh, and last but not least, that's very important, you have to have a mobile, a mobile number to, to register to that website. If you want to register to Facebook, if you want to register to Google+, if you want to register to Instagram, you just use, the, for Instagram, obviously the mobile web or, or a website. In Japan, you cannot register without your phone number. You have, at the end of the registration process, use your phone number. It's actually not the number, it's actually an email because every phone, every, uh, phone number in Japan comes with a specific email. But let's not go into these details, meaning that there's some, since everybody has a, a, has a phone, that ensures them that the account is, is true, valid. It's, there's someone behind it, because if there's a phone, there's a person. So it's not like you cannot create fake accounts. It actually also has some, in case they have some issues with a privacy, they can actually contact you. So this is also something that might happen in, uh, uh, in, in other countries. But what I proposed, I was at Bell Labs in Tokyo. So I was, I was, uh, I was uh, um, a speaker at Bell Labs in Tokyo in December uh, 2011. And if you think about it, uh, one of the things that could be done, because there's all these problems, uh, who is online? Can we actually check if these people are real? Can we, uh, and especially, can we know if these, if these people are over 18 or less than 18 years old? You could actually do an API ID, ID check. This is what I propose. So the Orange, for instance, when you register with Orange with your phone, they have your name, your address, and your date of birth. When you register on Facebook, you're, you don't have to put all this information, but they just maybe want to know if you're less than 18 or more than 18 years old. So you could ima imagine an API that calls the, the that, that is sent to the operator. The operator anonymizes you know, your data, so there's no address being shared, but he just uh, hooks back with, yes, over 18, no, under 18. That could be a solution uh, to the various problems uh, the social networks are facing nowadays. So, privacy, anonymity, mobility, obviously this is something that, of course, uh, Facebook has been criticized. Is, do, you think, do you feel safe on Facebook sharing your data? Yes or no? Yes, raise your hands. <clears throat> no? Oh yeah, well. Yeah, there you go. Are you anonymous on Facebook? Obviously not. And I just want to know here in Poland, do you use, who uses Facebook mostly on mobile? Raise your hand. And the rest, mostly on the web? Yeah, few, yeah. So the trend, <laughs> sorry for you, man. <laughs> the, the, trend, the trend is actually reversing, meaning more and more people are using mobile. This is exactly, so the kind of challenges the Jap Japanese had have, 
are starting actually now in, in our countries, especially for Facebook. And you might have heard all of the, the debate that was going on. Facebook has a hard time monetizing users, uh, so there's no revenue coming from mobile or because there's like no ads for the moment. Uh, these are the numbers, Eight, 870 million uh, dollars coming from, uh, of revenue from advertising, but this is basically only on the web. There's not, almost nothing coming on mobile. So how do you monetize mobile? How do you make it work? So obviously advertising was, is, is one way, but there's other ways, and this is exactly what I'm go going into. This is something that will, you, you might like. So remember DNA I showed you at the, at the very beginning? They use advertising. They actually obviously use advertising, but advertising is only 10% of their revenue model. Only 10%. Can you guess what's the 90%? We can guess that. No, nobody? nobody? Virtual items. They actually sell you goods. They allow people to sell goods between each other. There's is a virtual currency. This is how they make 90% of the revenue. And you remember the slides I showed you at the beginning? In 2010, they had $1.3 billion of revenue only with 25 million users back then. So meaning with this small amount of user base, they were able to monetize a lot and not on advertising, but on virtual items. This is, uh, this is actually the, the, the chart that is on their, on their annual report. And you can see, if you look at the lines here, the blue line, the dark blue line, is actually revenue coming, revenues coming from virtual items, and the others are advertising and, and, uh, and residual revenue. So you can see it's not new, it's been going on for quite a while. And if I concentrate here, you can see it says item billing in games, uh, and it's, there's one word, it says mobile coins. So what is mobile coins exactly? Mobile coins is a virtual currency. So when you are on this, on this network, you, can, you actually can play, for instance, you can play games. When you play a game, you can actually buy items for your character. Like you, know, like you could do on Far Farmville and all these other stuff, they've been doing that for a long time. But the difference is, is it's, being, it's being billed more, more, more often than not on the carrier. So it's your phone bill that gets uh, built and not your credit card. You can also do that by online banking and especially by Bitcash. Bitcash is a very fun thing when you can actually simply go in convenience stores top up your card, uh, but so it's a prepaid card, you top it up, and then automatically your account is topped up on, the, on the, the social network, and then you have a, a lot of money. Why is that important? Because if you have top up cards, uh, then obviously what happens is that you don't need a credit card, and you open the market of all these people who don't have a credit card. You don't need a credit score rating system, you can actually direct, tap directly into people that are just willing to uh, buy virtual items. The, Sorry, and this is the trend in the past just two years. You can see that the trends of virtual items has been going very, very quickly up, very, very quickly. And the beauty of it, who is a developer here? Who's a developer who develops applications or anyone actually active in gaming here? So meaning, okay. So this is a formula in Japan for that DNA. So one free-to-play game, remember free-to-play, is not a game you have to pay to download, it's free-to-play. They need two programmers, three engineers, and one art designer, so it's seven people. The average development cycle is four months, for one game, four months. They make one million dollars one, one dollars of revenue a year for just with seven people, and the shelf life of such a game is five years. So with seven people, four months of development, they have five million dollars of revenue. So this is, uh, this is all thanks to virtual items. This is not thanks to advertising, which, is, which are very hard to actually monetize on games because people are, are, are really thinking about a game and not and clicking some banners on the side. It's purely on in-app purchases, virtual item purchases, and uh, item exchange. Sorry, so two, three, oh yeah, one, two, three, four, five, yeah, 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 actually, yeah, no, it's true, why? No, no, you're right, no, you're actually right, you're actually right. There were two programmers, three engineers, it could be one of two art designers. Yeah, I used a maximum that put one, yeah, but you're right, you're right. But it's, on average, it's seven people. 
Thank you for noticing that. Uh, I, should, I, I will uh, upgrade it for next time. So, agree, the other social network. Same ID. Uh, you, you, you can see here on social games, this is, this is a revenue model. On the blue side, you can basically have you know, the traditional things. Q&A, community, diary. Diary is putting your updates. Q&A is actually asking questions like you can do on Facebook. Community is basically reading a news feed. And this is a growth space, like, like the traditional model. And the other side, you have this, the social games, all these games, when people can purchase items. And this is where they get the money. As you can see here, it's sadly on two different uh, scales. But if you, if, you, if you actually read the scale on the left, you see that the paid services sale, which is actually the virtual items uh, uh, growth, is reaching almost 40, uh, 40 billion yen. And on the other side, advertising is only reaching 3 billion yen, which obviously means that you have the same ID, 90%, 10% uh, on, this, on this network. They've bought recently OpenFaint. OpenFaint was a platform that existed in the US. They actually, what they want to do, they want to expand their, their expertise uh, from uh, so online social gaming outside of Japan. So they bought this platform for actually a, a huge sum of money, to be honest with you guys. And they're, they're trying now to duplicate their model outside of Japan. So it's something you should look it up if you're into ga if you're a, a gaming development system. It's one platform that could be actually very relevant for you guys. But the thing is, oh, I can see this is a number of users. I'm not going to go there now. The, this. So you've seen Don Dodge shared some stats earlier, remember? I've seen that three of these slides, I don't know if he's in the room or not. I hope not because he won't like me. Uh, three of these slides come from Mary Meeker. Who's, who's heard of the Mary Meeker report of Kleiner, Kleiner Perkins? So it was at D10, so all things digital, uh, last, uh, when was it? A month ago, no, even a bit less. It was all over the web, TechCrunch, everywhere you could find it. You can, you can read a report. And what is interesting in that report is that she actually goes into how mobile is eating the world. This is what, what Don said. She actually shared that, that slide that made someone remark that the numbers were wrong for Poland. I don't know if they were wrong or not, but actually, yes, they might have been wrong because this slide is actually not correct. She uses three slides of Japan, about Japan, sorry, to show how Japan is in the way, which I believe, and to show how Japan will change the way we monetize on mobile. And she says the future is bright, it's all magnificent and great, and that's why that was not on her little uh, slide. I added some hearts and little butterflies here because the future is bright, everything's going to work out great. Well, no. And this is this is Purikura. The little butterflies there, you know, that's how you enhance a quality of your picture. This is something very popular in Japan. You go, you take a pic your picture in a photo booth. Again, you can add a lot of stuff around you. This is actually what she, she, she's done there. She actually took some numbers and she put like a lot of nice words around it and make it sound like it was a wonderful future. It's exactly the same thing you do with a picture. You go, you put a lot of nice hearts and, and stars and stuff and you feel like a star. This is another graph. I won't tell you what it is. So you can see here is a huge, massive drop here. And like I said, I can, I can create a graph that makes no sense at all I, uh, as well. I can just say, oh, Mary Meeker spoke and everything crashed. Nah, I could say that, right? Actually, she spoke after that crash. She spoke there. That's June. I'm, I seem not telling you what it is, but she spoke there, not there. Meaning she actually missed something here on the numbers she's actually displayed. So what was that? What happened? And what is that graph? Actually, that graph is a stock market. On one day, we lost 20, almost 24% of its uh, market cap. DNA, 20%, a cyber agent, which is another online gaming, uh, um, mobile gaming company, 20% as well. There was $3.8 billion lost in one day of stock trading that day. And that happened a month before Mary Meeker spoke at D10, and she didn't even see it, meaning she must not really be following what's going on in Japan. So what happened? I told you that virtual items are very important. The game mechanics, Ben talked about it a little bit before. Why do you keep going about, why do you keep, oops, who's playing Angry Birds here? 
I've beaten all the levels. I'm very good. Yeah, I'm very high in score. You cannot beat me. I'm too, for too long in planes. So basically, what makes you come back to games is very clever game mechanics. But sometimes, you can go a bit far. This is how it's, going, uh, how it's happening in Japan, actually. Uh, so take a look at your screens. So basically, the first, the first image here is a phone. So you click on a gasha. Gasha is basically some type of lottery. So you click on your, on the, uh, in the game on the phone, and it basically like, rolls and gets you a card. Because these games play on card. You want, you know, I told you virtual items. So some, some items you can get by buying them, and some items you can, you, you can buy without knowing what the items will be. So you put like, I don't know, 10 cents, and then you get an item. But you don't know beforehand what it will be. This is why it's so cheap. But to get some very special items that are very rare in the game, you need to find the right combination of pre-items. So basically, to, in, in order to get, for instance, like uh, let's say a sword that will destroy all your enemies, before that, you need to find four different items that will unlock this one. So you see where that's coming. So you keep, so every time you click here, you get, you pay. So you get one card, another card, another card, another card. But then you say, oh, but I'm missing the card I want. So you click, you pay. You click, you pay. You click, you pay. What is that? It's gambling. That's a problem. That's a problem that Japan has had, is that they went too far. They were said, okay, let's do whatever we want of our virtual items, but they started having this kind of, it's, not, it's still game mechanics, but it goes into gambling territory. It goes into, yeah, I click and I get a number of cards, and if I get the right, the right combination of cards, the right combination of items that will unlock the special item. This is really, for me, gambling. This is actually what happened in Japan, is that suddenly the government realizes, oh, but we have all these kids playing with games, and they're actually gambling. So the reason you saw before that huge, huge, huge growth in the past two years for virtual items and money, uh, revenue for the, for the Japanese social networks, is because kids were playing a lot. So do you think it's moral? You know, the Japanese government didn't think so, so they actually, the consumer affairs agency started regulating. And obviously when they announced that with a report, it was not even out, when the report was announced, it was the day when everything crashed. And it was exactly a month before Mary Meeker spoke at D10. So the future is bright, yes, but there are limits to what you can do with uh, virtual items and game mechanics. And the other problem is real money trading. So what is real money trading? is that not only you can earn badges, earn cards, earn items, if, if I have one, but I know that Alex there wants one that I have but he doesn't have, we go on sites like eBay and we trade. Because he wants that item and I want an item that he has, or he will buy me items that I don't have. So then you create a non-secondary economy where kids actually go on auction websites trying to get the items they didn't have. So they keep playing to get items to try to sell them and they try to, sell, to buy others. So that created a huge, huge uh, um, influx of money as well, and, and obviously government oversight. And that's why, as you can see, the number, it's gambling on gambling, if you want. You try to gamble even more. Um, but this has been a little bit less active in the past uh, past year because you know these social networks are not completely stupid and they realize that oh the government is gonna is gonna wipe us out if we if we're not doing anything so they try to monitor what's going on on on, on uh, auction websites so what I'm saying here is that for me virtual items is the key is one of the biggest the better key to monetize social networks especially mobile social networks in app purchases especially in games are very important but do not believe people that tell you that will resolve anything. It's just everything and it's very easy to implement. It is not, and it comes with a lot of challenges. So mobile revenue still has a lot of challenges. They still, Japanese social networks still make a lot more money than Facebook, Twitter, and all the other combined, but there are still challenges coming up. And these are something, some mistakes that we shouldn't actually uh, try to replicate uh, in Europe. Akihabara, who knows about Akihabara? Who, who considers themselves a geek? Raise your hand. Oh, not that many actually, boy. Okay. Akihabara, who's been to Akihabara? For the, uh, the guys who've been in Tokyo, yeah, obviously, yeah. Plus you said you were a geek, so you have to go to Akihabara. Akihabara is, I, I love, uh, of course I love this station, is the area is also known as Electric Town, where you found everything. So for instance, uh, 
How, how am I making it on time? Now I'm asking you. Am I good on time? Um, 15 minutes left. 15 minutes left. Oh, I'll have to speed it up. So, what you can find out here about it, this is actually a, a watch that is exactly designed like the train we're taking, but it's geek porn. You can find everything that geeks like. So first of all, this kind of stuff. You can find every electronic comp components in the world there. Because a lot of people are doing Arduino. They're doing the DUI machines themselves, and you can find really everything. It's just amazing. It's the best place in the world to be there. Then you can also find all the games you want. In the games from the 70s, for the 80s, for all type of platforms, some you, ne you might never have heard about, some that were never actually released, but some people were able to get the prototypes out. So you can find any, any games you want. This is the best place as well for that. You can also, the, the very famous maid cafes, when you have maids actually serving you coffee. I'm not going to get into there, but if you want more details, you'll ask me. You can find a lot of, well, you see that on the screen, and I took a very low-key thing, but there's a lot of X-rated stuff as well around Akihabara, geeks like that as well. You can find these, guys, these type of guys actually wandering the street. This guy is actually a friend. He's called uh, Danny Chu. He also sells, sells a lot of, of all that is around anime. It's very famous. And you can see some people like this. Maybe some um, Alex will recognize the guy who is uh, there on the screen. It's, he's called KK. The front, the, in front is uh, Julie. She's a very fam famous, AV, uh, very famous um, model in, in Japan. These guys, these are the kind of guys you can find. Who knows who these guys are? Can you see? Somebody uh, here about something? Okay, can, so here's, you have, you have uh, Dave Troy from, uh, you have Shaquille Khan from PATH. You have uh, Dave Troy, short mail. Marcus, he was a Salesforce, he just left. Christine Liu. You have, I don't know. And you have that guy. Do you, do you recognize that guy there? That guy. Who knows who that guy is? Ah, come on, what? Dave. Dave, so what does he do, Dave? What's GOAP? He does movies for the same song. <laughs> ah, what, what, what? Geeks on a Plane. Who's heard about Geeks on a Plane? Okay, yeah, yeah, of course you do, Derek. So, why do I say that? I'm a geek, that's for sure. I've been five times on Geeks on a Plane. I've been lucky enough, I've been co-organizing, helping organize the ones in, in, in Asia, I've been going to South America, I've been to a lot of places. You've heard before, they're hesitating about coming to Poland. So we're going to do a Geeks on a Play tour with a lot of guys this is September. We have the whole trip locked down besides the end. And the end is between the Balkans and Poland. Okay? So basically, please, you take your phones now and you tweet. And you use these words. So Geek Fight, that's the, the hashtag you should use. Go, that's Geeks on the Plane. You add Dave McClure and you add 500. And please do that as much as you can. We have to win. I mean, the Balkans have started doing movies, have started doing holy great fucking shit online, and they're actually winning the game now. So basically, right now, the Balkans are going to be chosen to, free f to do the Geeks on a, player, uh, on a Plane tour. So please, do whatever you want to do. Do the most crazy shit you can think about today and tomorrow. But if you tweet about it loud enough, and if you do have the craziest possible shit, and we'll keep on doing that this afternoon, please be very, very loud, and you'll have a chance to meet the greatest VCs in the world, the greatest companies in the world. Usually we have people, you know, for all, the, all these companies you keep hearing about, the, the best ones, the best startups, will be on that, on that tour. We've been doing tours all around the world, and you have the, it's the best opportunity for you guys to meet these guys. So if you want them to come here, please, Use these, tag, these two hashtags, at Dave McClure, 25 times a, a minute, even 25,000 tweets per second if you can. But please do it and you'll get him. Okay, I promise you that. So back to Japan now. So Akihabara, it means the field of autumn leaves. The Galapagos. For a long time, the Japan was called the Galapagos in terms of their ecosystem. Why? Because these are the kind of phones you could find. Very cute phone, right? And you could find also this. And I don't know if anyone likes Gundam, but this is my favorite phone. You can have a phone that actually transforms as a Gundam phone. It's a transformer phone, if you want. It's really, really cool. The only problem is that these phones look very awesome from the outside. You could do a lot of stuff with them. Actually, you had TV, you had a lot of... But suddenly, something happened on July 11, 2008. Doesn't anyone know what happened on July 11, 2008? Yeah, I did 13 hours of Q to get it. 
the iPhone. The iPhone appeared in Japan. It was the, the iPhone 3G was the first iPhone to appear in Japan because, as I told you, there's no 2G network, so all the previous iPhones couldn't work. That the iPhone changed everything, like everywhere, but the iPhone changed everything. You had the Galake or the Keita. Galake was the kind of phones you had before. All these fancy, nice phones were like Disney phones or whatever. And suddenly they hold, you know, the, the, it became a, a smartphone world as well. And that was a big shock for Jap Japanese because Japanese phones used to have, as I told you before, the portal. Everybody was accessing the mobile web. It was a, a mobile web as dictated by the operator. And now the mobile, the completely free web, you can do whatever and go wherever you want. And also the app store, the first app store was made by iMode in 1999. So that was years and years before Apple, but the app store was controlled by iMode. And suddenly you have, you have a, an app store that is not controlled by an operator. That was a huge shock for Japan. Not to mention that a lot of the features that the phones used to have were not present in the iPhone and not present in the Android when they came out as well. Like again, I said TV and other stuff. To the point that Nokia actually had to pull out in 2008 because they were not able to make it in the market. So really the iPhone make a huge impact. And nowadays, these are estimates for the first number. I say there's more than 13 million iPhones in Japan. Some people disagree with me. That's my estimate because Apple doesn't release numbers. And uh, we're pretty sure there's around uh, more than, a little bit more than 20 million uh, Android phones. Don said it earlier about the rise of mobile phones. In Japan, it's estimated by 2015, so it's already in th less than three years, all the mobile phones will be smartphones. There will be nothing, more, nothing, uh, nothing, uh, nothing anymore. If you actually go now on the websites of Japanese uh, uh, mobile carriers, you see that all the phones they're releasing are only smartphones already. There's no more any other type of, smart, of smartphones. Only KDDI does a few, but never mind. And actually, they're making good, uh, even in that iPhone world, that's uh, a screenshot of, that's a screenshot of the, uh, of the App Store. You can see number one, number uh, four, number five. These are games that were made by the companies I'm, I'm, I mentioned before. So that actually, they're actually able to make these mechanics I told you about work on the iPhone as well, which is why I told you you should look at uh, platforms like OpenFaint if you're working in gaming. The interesting uh, thing is that the first game you see there, Imagine, because a lot of people are talking about Angry Birds, the first game you see there, they're doing $26 million uh, revenue per month with that, just that game, one game on uh, the iPhone, and just in Japan. So meaning they actually know their shit when it comes to gaming. We g yes? Can you go back? Yes. Why there is only 67 Sorry? Why there is only 67 Because it was just released at that time. Yep. He asked, he asked me why there's only 67. Uh, oh, yeah, there's another reason. Yeah, okay, I'm not going to go dwell into too much into that. But you know that you need to have people in Japan do not review and comment easily with real names. And they're afraid that because their name is tied with an Apple ID, that they, will, they, they, they do not feel free going and actually reviewing stuff as easily as we do. I don't care about going uh, on the App Store and putting my name, Paul, and I hated that game and I love that app. I'll do it. Japanese users are not as, as open to that. So that also means that the, lo the, the count is, go ahead. Um, you, you said open something and I missed it. Open find. Open flight? Find, F-E-I-N-T. F-E-I-N-T. I'll, I'll, I'll write it for you afterwards if you want. You can go on GRE International, G-R-E-E -E International, you'll find it. But I'll, I'll, I'll come to see you afterwards. So Tokyo, I'm going to go a little bit faster. I, lo I love that, that uh, it's the eastern capital. What I want to see is, okay, this. Do I have Wi-Fi or not? Okay. Ooh, I hope he works. Can you see that? Okay. This is, uh, okay, you put a card here or your phone, and what does it open? It actually opens a toilet. Why do I show you this is because NFC, everybody talks about NFC. You know what NFC is, right? Everybody has, we have, it's called Osafu Keitai, it's a different, it's a different standard, no, no matter, but almost 50% of the people have phones that are tap and go. Tap and go means you have a chip inside, you can open a toilet door, you can go to the subway, you can buy stuff, you can do everything with your phone, every single thing. So that's what actually Google is trying with the Google Wallet and other companies are trying. In Japan, it's been going on for a very long time. I was shocked when I arrived there, at, with a single phone, I could buy stuff in a vending machine, I could enter the subway and go out of the subway, I could open again doors, I could do everything, I could buy tickets, I could go into cinema, I could, I could do everything with it. 
as this is this shows why also I think that NFC or any again I'm not talking NFC as a standard but the fact that you have your phone and you have this intimate relationship with it that is something that could be the next form of payment of course so 50% so, so of tap and go phones 10% of people use mobile wallet mobile wallet why because you have two choices when you actually go uh, use your phone as um, uh, um, as a payment system one is to actually use the carrier so you will you be built on your phone bill and the other one is to tie with a credit card company so both work and some people opt for one or, or the other but it's very prevalent but what is the most interesting and this is one example i want to show you if you add nfc and mobile and you add the coupon and loyalty system with it you arrive at something quite extraordinary you know what you, you pr probably understand what it is right so that's the biggest mac burger you can find in japan it's uh, the big stuff at the, at the top is like a it's an egg it's a massive egg so this is the biggest thing they have why do i show you mcdonald's they did a system of coupons a loyalty system when every time you go to mcdonald's i know some people say it's not healthy but whatever that's the example you go to the mcdonald's you pay with your phone you get a coupon when you get a coupon you know the next time you might get a five percent off or ten percent off so you keep doing that so they were able with that to, of course, get a lot of data about the users. But the most amazing thing is they have 16 million registered users. That's 12% of the Japanese population is using the system. Imagine the scale of that thing. 16 million registered users to the McDonald mobile uh, loyalty program. That's a lot of people. And this is something that for me is even more interesting than mobile payments, is that have this ability of everything on your phone. This is something that they, that they have achieved in Japan already. And you have probably Ronald McDonald here as a, as a mascot for McDonald's in, in Poland. That's a mascot in Japan, okay? I'm sure guys are really happy about that. So, uh, I'm gonna skip that. Just the reason why it works, uh, we can talk about that later, is benevolent dictators. The difference is that here, you don't, in Japan, you have one uh, operator, Docomo, the carrier. It's so strong that everything it decides actually works. Just one the number I wanted to give you is 20% uh, of online commerce is mobile. And I think Don mentioned the, uh, the, the Apple tax of 30%. In Japan, actually, if you don't go through Apple, it, the normal, uh, the normal, the normal share, ref share will be only 10%. So it's actually, that's also what helped growing the, the, the market. And they can see the market for mobile commerce is actually 10 times bigger in Japan than it is in the US, and again, for a less uh, part of the population. I'm not going to skip that. This is a very cool thing uh, if for those who are interested in, in, in advertising. Very simple advertising. You know, the, the phones were not made to actually show movies. It's actually difficult to see on a small screen. So what, what this company did it, it is, is for ads, you had to pair your phone with, with another person, it usually was a guy or the girl. So the girl you were interested in, or if you're a girl, the guy you were interested in, you would actually just touch two phones and then the movie will run and part of the movie will be on one screen and part of the movie will be the other. Some parts will be completely synced and some parts will be unsynced. So each of, each of these people would have um, um, a different message. And that was for the launch of a song, of a CD single. And that CD single got uh, more than two million paid downloads uh, in just uh, a few months. So meaning that they have also locked down the way of doing mobile uh, ad uh, business. Shinagawa, the next station. Uh, I love the Shinkansen. I was, I'm a huge otaku, huge train otaku, meaning I love, I love trains. I'm a big fan of trains. So obviously I was really, really happy in Japan. This is the biggest station where all the Shinkansen go in the rest of Japan. River of Goods. Who knows, who can guess what this is? And please not with, no, you know that. So shut up, Alex. Who can guess what this is? Sorry? C3PO? No, it's not three, C3PO. No, it could be, actually. <laughs> Any idea? So it's actually a vending machine. But the difference between the traditional vending machine, uh, in Japan, you have vending machines everywhere. A lot of vending machines in the street all the time, everywhere. But this one is actually a huge screen. There's no, you cannot see anything. It's just a screen. The thing is, not only is the screen, it's really fancy because you just touch the screen to choose your, 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 your drinks. But actually, when you go in front of it, it's better if you're Japanese, to be honest with you. When you go in front of it, the machine recognizes you and analyzes your face and recommends a drink for you. So depending on your features, it will tell you, oh, you're, first of all, you recognize if you're a girl or a guy, and then you will actually recommend a, a, a drink would be either a strawberry something or a Coca-Cola or something. In actually, to be honest, 
someone like me doesn't really work that well. I think it's not very well adapted for tall white dudes, but actually it's really fun. And this is, why do I say that? I'm talking about digitized goods is because this is a book. This is a book. In, in Japan, they launched these uh, very short books on, um, on, um, on mobile phones. And uh, is, that, is that the whole book? It's the whole book in chapters. No, in ch it's a, yeah, but you, of course you have to do a lot more screens, but you have the whole book, uh, you can buy it by chapters. Uh, in 2007 already, more than half of the top fiction bestsellers in Japan were actually mobile books. You know, we're still struggling about finding ways to, to make content, uh, how to monetize you know, content like books. You know, the news industry has problems, the books industry has problems, the music industry has problems. In 2007, already in Japan, they were able to, s to set the record of having uh, more than half of the, these uh, mobile books being on a top seller list. So something else that yeah, we could learn a lot about. Ebisu, that's my favorite session. And I know I will go a little bit over time. Ebisu, why? Ebisu is also the name of beer. Have you heard of uh, Sapporo? Sapporo beer? Yeah, so Yebisu is one of the beers that belongs to the Sapporo group. Uh, there next to the station of, of Ebisu, you have this place where it's an old, old brewery, and this is where all the cool tech events would take place, obviously, because, you know, tech events and beer. So that would always, that was, that's why I have the fondest memories of this place. Uh, and someone asked, I added that yesterday at 2 a.m. in the morning, because someone asked me yesterday when we, ha we were having dinner, is there any interest graph in Japan? You know, interest graph is, instead of having a social network of people you know, is creating a social network of people with similar interests. And there's, there's such things, but I want to just mention to you two examples. Uh, first of all, with the anonymity in Japan, it's, tr it's certain that interest graphs are much more prevalent. They need to have another way to find who you care about, because if you don't put your real name online, there's no way to know who you're talking to. So obviously, interests have a higher, higher uh, importance in Japan. But the, the most funny things I've ever seen, that's why I'm mentioning Nintendo, you were going, I think it was two years ago, I was going in Tokyo and Nintendo had released a game that was massively successful that used Wi-Fi. Everybody, when you're on a Nintendo machine, you would actually just put, uh, it was on a, you know, the, the, of course, the, cons the, the small, the portable machine. You could actually create an avatar and start playing, but the, the game was to be playing with other people. But Japanese, instead of playing at home, they got to play outside to the point that Nintendo had to set up spaces in Tokyo with enclosures because it was so successful and people were gathering there and you would see people just standing like this and playing for hours next to each other. Never talking to each other, but next to each other. What I mean by that is that Japan has this ability of creating uh, massive memes around interests. And this is what, hap what happened first. The other example is, I, I'll come to that later, is that this is food. We all like food. In Japan, they have the biggest, uh, the world's biggest recipe, uh, recipe uh, sharing website in the world. They have like more than 20 million users and it's a, it is a massive success. So this is another type of interest graph. And of course, the food I've just shown you was a squid. And if you drink too much, this is how you end up uh, in the subway. And this is actually an actual poster that you can find in Tokyo because they don't want you to be drunk in the subway. So they ask you to do that at home. But trust me, you have experiences of me being like this. So, um, Last one, I'm just going to go away from my line. Lompongi, this is, I love this example. This is a shop. So Lompongi, was, for those who've been in Japan, I'm pretty sure so if you've been in Tokyo, you've landed, you've been in Lompongi because it's the most expat friendly place in Tokyo. You have all the expats go there, all the gaijins as we call them. And you have a lot of shopping stores. And of course, it's a bit, you have a lot of entertainment clubs. So you, you, you understand what I mean by entertainment clubs. You, know, you have the regular clubs, and then you have uh, guys who hang out. Yeah, do you want to visit ladies? And then when you work at night, you have this shop. And this shop is a pet store. It's a pet store in the middle of this district. And I never understood for a while what this pet shop was, and especially why it is open 24-7. Why would people that go in a red light district, why would people that, that go out of club, because also regular clubs, go to a pet, pet store at 3 a.m., 4 a.m. in the morning. And the whole window, what it had, is if you go, if you see the window, you see little puppies, little kittens and little, little dogs, very cute. Very, and I, I was like, how the hell are they making money? And one day I got it. One day I got out of a club at 4 a.m. in the morning. I was in the area, and there was this couple of Japanese in front of me, one guy, one girl. 
And the girl, she was totally wasted. She goes into the front of that store, and of course, the first thing she says, I want to buy that puppy. And they were making a lot of shit tons of sales because people were drunk and actually buying that of impulse buying. This is the best example you have on impulse buying in Japan. You, can, you buy stuff because you're completely drunk, you like the puppy. And the guy, of course, the guy would say, because his, his girlfriend is shouting that she wants a puppy, the guy would actually, of course, offer the puppy. So there was massive sales for that shop. Um, I'm not gonna go there because we don't have time. Uh, yeah, I just want to mention that it's something, it, impulse is very important on mobile. This is why I wanted to say you. And actually, if you look, you know, you've heard about the tsunami that happened in Japan. 56% of the people who gave donations in the US gave it through uh, a mobile. And it, it, they gave it because they saw a number and immediately they reached through their pocket and gave money. This is something that also uh, uh, is very important with mobile. You can create a lot of impulse buying uh, behavior in, in, your, in your customers. I'll finish with Shibuya. Obviously, everybody knows Shibuya because of the very famous crossing where everybody is. But what, not what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to Shibuya means sober valley in in, in Japanese. And uh, there's this dog. There's a statue of this dog that actually sits in front of Shibuya. It's called Chico. Uh, this dog is the story is uh, it goes like this. This was this guy who was going to work every day with his dog, and the dog was actually going with him to the station and then waiting for him at the, at the, uh, the whole day at the station and then leaving uh, when, um, when he would come back. And one day, the person, the owner of the dog, died at work. So he never came back. But the dog kept going to the station for nine years. Every morning and every evening, the dog was waiting in front of the door where the, the train was leaving, and the dog was, was waiting for there. And the reason I'm saying that is that's dedication. And for those of you who are startups, uh, especially uh, in other countries, I can tell you that Japan shows the best dedications I've ever seen in the world. Obviously, you've heard, as I just told you, about the tsunami and the effect it had. Everything was re rebuilt very, very quickly. And this is a lesson for all of us. So you should, uh, you should learn about that. I'm not gonna, I'm, I could go on for hours. I just wanna thank you for listening to me babbling for hours. I know you're very hungry. Here's my name and see you later. Okay, guys, thanks. Well, there were plenty of amazing examples of uh, what is going on in Japan, as especially yep. in this uh, social environment. Yep. Uh, how about who is doing it? Uh, what, what do you mean, who is doing it? Who? What is, uh, uh, how no. do you perceive the startup environment or ecosystem or whatever we perceive it in uh, US or in Europe? Uh, is it exist in that way, how we... Oh, you mean all the, all the, you know, these, these were startups that started. All these were startups like more than 15 years ago that grew. The, it's true, the, the problem you have with Japan, and this is the reason I didn't want to, to talk too much about some of the topics, is that they're very specific to Japan. But the way these were created were like the ways are created everywhere else in the world. You have payment systems, you have your own, you have eBay's, you have auction sites, you have uh, uh, portal sites, you, you have social networks, exactly the same story. It's just that because uh, there's one reason people, for instance, use a lot of mobiles in Japan is also because they commute a lot. You know, you have to stay two hours in the train to go, especially when you live in Tokyo, to go to work. So you would obviously have your phone with you and you would uh, do something with it. So they, uh, uh, they understood very early that people would actually be able to, uh, will have uh, dedicate some of their time to do activities on their mobile phone. That's why they went very quickly to the mobile environment. Plus, the other thing that made, me able, uh, made them able to jumpstart uh, this uh, evolution is that contrary to us, most of the people there didn't have uh, uh, a PC at, at, at the office. It's the PC at the office, I mean, there's a long story, but basically we had access so much of maybe less in Poland, I would agree, and in other emerging countries, but we had a PC that was so prevalent that for us there was no reason to go on a mobile, especially because the mobile was way less powerful than a PC. But when you don't have a PC or you don't have network access with your PC, you just have the regular Word and other office suite, but you don't have access to email or web, but you have it on your phone, then by, def by default you want to use your phone. So that was how it jump started. But then who's behind it? companies like you would have, like the same type of companies you have here. You have operators, startups, media company, advertising agencies, the same type of ecosystem. Uh, there are so many startups as seen we are uh, seen, uh, for example, in US, in Silicon Valley or in Europe. Uh, uh, you know, uh, startups uh, are so uh, familiar early 
uh, uh, companies on the early stage. Uh, other people in Japan, young people in Japan, are so eager to to do their oh. own company. That's a whole. That's a very long subject because entrepreneurship in Japan is much harder. There's a saying in Japan that says before, b basically, if if the nail is above the wood, you just smash it. Be everybody has to be the same. For those who have been in Japan, you might have seen that people are very much alike in terms of how the, uh, the clothes they're having. Do not believe, because a lot, you know, when you've never been in Japan, you have these images of anime and people, you know, having these amazing out uh, outfits and all. This is not like traditional, not everybody is having these kind of clothes in Japan. Most people are very, everybody has the same suit, the same shirt. It's a very conformist society. One of the slides I didn't have time to get through, when I present myself in Japan, when people present themselves, you don't hear you say your, your first name, Marek, and then you say your last name, and then you say, oh, and I work for. In Japan, you go the other way around. You start saying, I work for, that's my last name, is my first name, because you're less important than the company you work for. So imagine that mindset for entrepreneurs, how hard it is, because if you're an entrepreneur, you cannot start with the company you work for because it doesn't matter because it's, a, it's still non-existent for most Japanese. They will look at you and say, what are you? You should go work for Toyota. You should work for Japan Post. You should work for the big companies. So this is why entrepreneurship in Japan is very hard. But, and I'm finished with that, the iPhone and then, of course, other, uh, the, the, the app markets were great because they allowed people to create you know, these, a simple app. You didn't need to be in a company. Suddenly you could have, before all the accesses were blocked by the operators. I, I mean, it's the same everywhere else, but suddenly in Japan, and I was there, so I saw it, suddenly you see a lot of young people say, oh, I don't need the authorization for any, anyone. I just go create an app, put it in the app store, I'll see what happens. And that created, that started, that jump started that entrepreneurship. Not that entrepreneurs didn't exist before because those companies I mentioned were existing before, but they were very, very rare. And now it's actually growing, but it's actually very, very, still very, very hard in terms of being accepted by, the, uh, by your peers. I think, yeah, I think we cut it up because people want to eat, no? We, we have another thing. Well, we okay. Lunch. Oh, so I'm sorry. Okay, I'm leaving. Lunch. You'll be here. So I'll, I'll, I'll be here for two days. I'm a tallest guy, so you'll find me around. Okay, thank you, guys. Thank you.